really excited tonight uh, to welcome Mike Gonzalez to speak about Latin America and his new book, The Ever the Pink Tide. Um, it's an incredibly valuable and timely look at what is happening in the region, and it's a huge privilege to have you with us tonight. So will you all join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mike Gonzalez. Earned that. <laughs> I hope it's worth it anyway. But um, thank you very much for coming. It's brilliant that you're here, and I'm sure there are lots of issues that we can talk about and address. But let me sort of start the conversation with with a with a presentation of the book. It, it, it's difficult to know where to start this. The Pink Tide, which I'll talk about more in a minute as to what it is. Um, you know, was an enormously positive moment after a decade of exploitation, of globalization's rampant uh, travels across the world, you know, throwing people out of work, uh, destroying industries, undermining states, with the confidence that they had been told they could have because we had reached, you may not remember it, but a very famous phrase which marked the moment, uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama said, we had reached the end of history. The implication being, well, capitalism is all there is, and uh, capitalism then took off its, its, its velvet gloves and exposed its ruthless character in an even more dramatic way than it had already. And the 90s were a period of hardship and poverty across the world, but particularly in Latin America. So uh, the pink tide, as it was called, and I don't like the term, I used it because it's well recognized, but actually I think it was used ironically, sarcastically, about, uh, about the rise of, of, uh, of social movements and radical governments across Latin America. So I'll use it, but in, in large inverted commas, with a kind of cynical undertone. Mm -hmm. You have to hear it even if I don't use it. <laughs> Nevertheless, what it identifies is something real, something which, for all of us who are interested in Latin America and interested in social change, marked a tremendously important crossroads. It was a tremendously important crossroads because the overconfidence of global capitalism that it now had carte blanche to mark back, march back and forth across the planet to do whatever damage it wished to do, to achieve its own ends, to transform the lives of millions of people into, into lives serving their purposes. Suddenly, there was a challenge. The challenge was called the Pink Tide. Um, the nature of that challenge is important, and for the person who coined the phrase Pink Tide, all it was was the election of more radical governments. I want to, you know, my starting point is that the election of radical governments was not what was in, what was not the pink tide. The pink tide was the set of circumstances that gave rise to those governments. In other words, they rose on a tide of resistance, a tide of rebellion, which began to to rise. Um, I, I'm worried about nautical metaphors because I tend to get stuck halfway through. But anyway, the tide began to rise as I'll show in a minute, just at the very end of the 20th century. On the eve of the 21st century, new forces appeared, new, new possibilities of struggle appeared, which, and particularly in Latin America, which we can describe, and which the pink tide is, is destined to describe. So what, what I try to do in the book is talk about this, as I'm going to in a minute. Uh, however, you know, I have to be honest, and that is to say that I'm, I want to describe the circumstances and the nature of these movements. They are exciting, they are creative, and they bring into the center of political, of, of political activity whole sections of the population which until then had been disregarded, had been marginalized, or had felt themselves to be without power. So the real change is that those, those, those groups of people begin to sense and taste their own power. And for those of us watching this process from, from elsewhere, from Europe, or from the, from, the, from the world of the North, suddenly the unstoppable onward march of cap global capitalism seemed now to be encountering resistance, a rising level of resistance, and a level of resistance which could not only you know, achieve some victories, but also inspire the rest of us you know, to, to, to build and expand the, the, you know, the, the horizon of resistance. That was then. Today, in, in 2019, in a sense, I, my sense is that um, what I hope to do with the book is not just to, to, to 
to describe and, and narrate and analyze what's going on. But in a sense, I want to rescue the pink tide in its most positive aspects from those who have begun to use it for deeply reactionary purposes. Baldona, you know, the appalling monster that has become president of Brazil, Bolsonaro, used Venezuela as a threat and said, you know, this is what awaits you. Uh, Mike Pence, whom you won't know necessarily, <laughs> he's, he's the man who, who stands behind Donald Trump nodding, um, whatever Donald Trump says, he nods. Um, and uh, Mike Pompeo, you may not know, you may know him as the Secretary of State for the American government. It, it, you might be better to know him as a, as a completely lunatic, extreme evangelical, a Christian Zionist who has just been to Israel to praise them for their assault on the Palestinians. So, um, you know, I, obviously when they talk about Venezuela or, or, and the Pink Tide more generally, they are trying to draw from it the most reactionary conclusions. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is, at first glance, the things that are happening there, and they are happening, and I have to talk about them, which is that the, many of those governments who rose on this tide of resistance have become corrupted, and the promises they made have been betrayed. Now, that means that the story I have to tell is not going to be entirely, you know, it, it, I can't pretend that this is not the case. What I can say is that, and the object of the book, is to say while this, has, this, this corruption of the process has happened, there are people in Venezuela, and I, you know, I've been in Venezuela the, the last seven years, for, I lived there more or less on and off for, for about six or seven years, and, um, uh, and I, you know, I saw some of the processes I've, I've been describing. Um, and, you know, I've had glimpses as well of the process in Ecuador and Bolivia, all of which come under the general heading of what came to be called 21st century socialism or Bolivarian, a Bolivarian revolution. So let me talk about that for a bit. Um, in each of those cases, the, the, the moment is one of disappointment. The moment is one of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of disappointment and questioning of the nature of that whole process. So I think in describing it, one honestly is imperative. There are lots of people around the world, left-wing left people, people sincerely committed to the purposes, to the, to the idea of social injustice, who feel that in a sense, if they are critical of what's going on in Latin America, they are somehow putting themselves on the side of the Bolsonaros and the Mike Pences and the, and the, and the popular party in Spain, all of whom use Venezuela as a stick to beat the people with. Okay, I don't believe that. I think what we have to do is, is really answer two questions. What is there about the, about the pink tide that gave us such feelings of optimism at the time that was so exciting? that it's imperative that we remember those elements because they demonstrated that the end of history had not been reached, that capitalism had not achieved its definitive victory. On the contrary, that there was resistance, that resistance would rise and grow, and more importantly, in the course of that resistance, the creativity and potentiality of mass popular movements would once again be demonstrated. That's what we can rescue from it. All right? And the other question we have to ask, which is more difficult, is why those processes have culminated in a situation in which people in Venezuela, whose potential wealth is uncountable, I mean, it has, it's, an enormous, it's the second largest reserves of oil in the world, um, enormous reserves of every mineral you can think of, and yet today in Venezuela, people are hungry. Three million Venezuelans have left the country fleeing. The, one of the leaders of the, of the Venezuelan government, a deeply unpleasant, cynical uh, military man called Diosdado Cabello, who's really the strong man of the government, had the cynical insolence to say that people were leaving because it had become fashionable, <laughs> as opposed to the fact that there's no food in Venezuela, there are 85% of medicines that are required are not available, and the whole place is disintegrating. So I want to address that and be honest about it, even if it, if it offends people who, want, who think that given that the enemy of my enemy is me, my friend. Well, Maduro is the enemy of you know, US imperialism and the multinational capitals. He's not. He's not. That's our, he's, he, they're our enemy. So on the simple equation of if they criticize Maduro, we must be on Maduro's side 
is too simple a formula and a dangerously simplistic formula. So I want to really honestly say that's not the way to address it. But let me go back. The pink tide. Um, 1999, the very eve of the 21st century, had been the end of a decade in which in which uh, global capitalism marched away across the world. What was the effect of that? The effect of that was to, in Latin America, let me restrict myself to that, was to under, was whatever welfare, whatever public spending, social spending existed in Latin America had been wiped out. Uh, the state, uh, you know, the, the new rules of the world system meant, for example, the World Trade Organization, which is now being mentioned in the, con in the context of the Brexit debate, be very clear what the World Trade Organization imposes. It, the World Trade Organization imposed on Latin America from the early 1990s the principle that no loans from any international agencies would be forthcoming for governments that used their money on social spending and on social, on social projects. You know, so, for example, the first effect was that, of that was in, in southern Mexico in Chiapas, the small farmers that produced maize and were able to do so because they got subsidies from the state, the subsidies were now eliminated. Result? Of course they couldn't. The small farmers, small maize farmers of southern Mexico could not produce maize at a price uh, similar to the, to the uh, price charged by the biggest maize producers on the w in the world, which are the American farmers. Of course, they were destroyed. They couldn't compete, and, uh, and their lives were put at risk. And that was where the first germs of resistance began. The Zapatista movement of southern Mexico was the first resistance against uh, neoliberalism and against the global capital in a tiny, remote corner of, of Mexico. But one wonderful thing had happened sort of by accident, which is that somebody had invented the World Wide Web, and this small, indi largely indigenous movement in southern Mexico started using the World Wide Web. So all of a sudden, a place that nobody had heard of, a small, rebellious section of Mexico, surrounded by 65,000 Mexican troops, communicated with the world and sent out a message this is neoliberalism, this is its reality, the impoverishment of the vast majority of people across the continent, we have to fight back. And that was the message that came from Chiapas. It was a message taken up five years later in America at a big demonstration outside the World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle called the Teamsters and the Turtles. The turtles, I have to tell you, disappointingly, weren't real ones. They were people dressed up as turtles, <laughs> environmentalists, who demonstrated outside and protested. And for the first time, unmasked the existence of these organizations, which were imposing the rules of survival in a, cap in a world capitalist economy, which included no public spending, which included everything, including, at one point, the genome, uh, of, uh, the human genome, would be subject to... Uh, to privatization, you know. So this was the, what was happening. An event had occurred a year earlier, that was in 1999, uh, which, whose significance would emerge only a couple of years later, and that was the election of a new president in, in Venezuela, a man called Hugo Chavez. Chavez uh, was a, a soldier. He had, had made a, an attempt, a pretty poor attempt at a military coup in February of 1992, which had failed. And he, he jailed, but he made, you know, one of those things in history, tiny, in, you know, irrelevant things that suddenly take on huge importance. The coup lasted 24 hours and failed. And then the government said to him, you must go on television and announce that the coup is over. So Chavez went on television. He said, because he didn't want more bloodshed, which I believe, and he said, the coup is over. And then he had a little phrase, two words, por ahora, for now. And that was enough to encourage. Suddenly, Por Ahora began to appear on all the. Oh, sorry. <laughs> God Almighty. Are you okay? <laughs> um, the. Um... <laughs> right, recover. Um, the, 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 as long as you recover, I'll recover. The, um, so that, those two words suddenly appeared to, uh, began to appear on the walls of Caracas, for example. Por Ahora, an announcement that it was far from over. He was elected to the presidency. It was an election, and his program at first was, you know, a liberal program, uh, promising defense of human rights, renaming Venezuela, promising to rename Venezuela the Bolivarian Republic, and a promise to 
to, uh, to uh, propose a new constitution. Now, the new constitution was, it was a liberal constitution in a country which had been governed for 45 years by a coalition of two ruling parties, the Democrats and the Republicans of, Mex uh, of Venezuela, who simply farmed out favors and held, held, um, held power on their own. But, um, but the central promise and the most important promise and the most, the most relevant for the discussion here was that the Constitution, number one, was the way it was drawn up. Uh, in every area of the country, meetings were held to elect delegates to a conference to decide to write the new Constitution. Now, that in itself was significant. It was called the Constituent Congress. That word became very important. But the second thing about it was that the key, uh, the key clause in the Constitution was that it would be a, a democratic constitution whose protagonist, whose, whose protagonist would be the people. It would be popular, demo participatory democracy. Now, maybe in the context of writing up bourgeois constitutions, you know, that might have seemed, you know, an aspiration, very worthy, but unlikely to come to anything. But then a series of other events began to occur which demonstrated that that idea of participatory democracy was central not just to the process in Venezuela, but to the rising movement of resistance across the continent. The most significant, I think, the most significant moment was in 2000 in Bolivia, in the city of Cochabamba. In the city of Cochabamba, the government, a government you know, run by, by, by uh, global capitalism, a neoliberal government, announced the privatization of the water company of Cochabamba. Um, now, you know, what that really meant, and there's a, there's a wonderful film which I recognize, uh, re recommend to you called Even the Rain, because in the contract that the government signed, they accepted that even the rain could be collected by, the, by, the, by a, the, the new company, a multinational company whose name became very familiar during the Iraq war, Bechtel, mm -hmm. who now became the owners of Cochabamba's water, including its rain. And that was kind of, if you'll forgive the expression, the last drop. The <laughs> one that, the, you know, the, in, in, in Spanish, the, the, the equivalent expression to the last straw is the last drop that makes the glass overthrow, overflow. And that's what it was. So that was, that was too much. And all the different sections, the market traders, the students, the, small, the workers in the small factories, the, 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 uh, the people in the, different, in the poor districts, the indigenous communities around the city, all discovered that, what they, that the defense of water was essential to their very survival. And for, so this movement grew up in Cochabamba and it took on the army and it fought back and it created a, uh, an organization called the Committee for Water and Life. And they fought and they won. The Cochabamba Water War brought the definitive defeat of Pechtel and the victory of a, of a local committee led by a, a guy, a wonderful man, modest, tiny man called Oscar Oliveira, an anarchist, who uh, led the Committee for Water and Life. It was an uprising of the population, you know, not because they were led by a kind of a political document or anything, but because they had reached the point where this was the last straw. And they got together and they organized across these different groups of interest into a unified committee and they fought back. There is um, a, a, in the book, it's crude, isn't it, recommending the book? But anyway, there's a, a letter from his sister, Marcelo Oliveira, who now leads the Committee for Water for Life, and she describes in a couple of pages um, the experience of running that. Now, not only did they win a war, but something else had happened, something much more profound as, as, t as time, would, as the, the decade would evolve, which is that not just that they fought and won against the company, they were enacting popular democracy. This was popular democracy because the decisions were made collectively. They, they, uh, in, in Bolivia in particular, they resurrected an old form of communal organization called the Cabildo Abierto, which literally means the open town council. In other words, decisions were made in public squares, in open debate, and of course that was echoed later in some of the movements that grew up elsewhere. In Spain, for example, where the 15th of May 
2015 produced movements which adopted this, this uh, method of open assembly to make decisions. So suddenly, from a constitutional provision in Venezuela, the concept of popular democracy, the reality of popular democracy, began to be created, and this is critical, from below. Now, it happened not just in Bolivia. In Ecuador, as, you, again, as I described, in, the, in, in 1990, the indigenous organizations began to get together, they unified, and they began to develop uh, forms of organization from below to take on the state. And in 1999, when the Ecuadorian state tried to turn the economy into a dollar economy, there was a rising of those organizations. I was privileged to go on one of their land occupations with, with, with this group of people, and they are just extraordinary, just extraordinary. You know, they, we all met in a, in a schoolyard. People had, you know, the big dishes with food and so on. And I noticed that the women who wear, in Bolivia, very long skirts, um, use them for very, very um, important purposes because as the skirt fell back, a machete underneath was exposed. So they were there for serious. This was a serious business, taking back their land. So in 1999 and again in 2003, the indigenous movement organized to throw out a government which attempted to impose neoliberal policies upon it. So what, what, what we begin to see is the emergence, not just of resistance movements, but of resistance movements which, whose, whose perspectives and whose actions are determined by internal democratic processes, all right? And, and as a result of that, you know, uh, winning victories, and, but mobilizing populations across uh, the whole range of different activities and experiences, drawing together different sections into, in, into, into a grassroots struggle, which, is, which was genuinely very impressive. Meanwhile, in Venezuela, Chavez, of course, had taken the presidency in one of the richest oil-producing countries in the world. And he'd taken, uh, taken the presidency with a policy which was beginning to be articulated now of using oil revenues for the benefit of the majority of the population. In other words, to rebuild you know, what had existed but had largely been destroyed, you know, a, a kind of social welfare state, to provide... Uh, health services, to provide schools, to provide housing, and to, and, and, and to develop social provision with the, with the wealth of oil. Of course, what that meant was that it had to, and, and this was the key issue, was to, because Ecuador produced one or two products for the world market, flowers, oil as well, Bolivia produced oil and gas, they were dependent on these products, which by and large were bought and sold on a world market by the great multinationals that controlled them. So the key issue was, in order to, to, to produce this democratic society in which, in which the prevailing issues would be social justice, the, 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 the democratic uh, distribution of income and wealth, then they had, first of all, not just to seize control of those industries, but begin to think seriously about generating and diversifying the economy so they wouldn't be dependent any longer on just that single product, which, which would necessarily bring them in, in, into the into the um, into the into a relationship with, into an unequal relationship with the world economy. So that was the issue, and oil prices were high, so it, it you know it seemed possible. And then in April, on the 11th and 12th of April, 12th and 13th of April 2002, uh, there was an attempt to overthrow Chavez. Now, you know, I can't. There's not time to go into it, but. You have to recognize the incredible popularity of Chavez and his capacity as a communicator. Um, you know, you could almost encapsulate his appeal by using the insulting word that the right wingers, the right wing opposition used about him when they said he's ugly. Now, it doesn't, may not seem very much, but ugly in Venezuela means dark skinned with features with features from, a, from an indigenous uh, heritage. That's what it meant. And then he had the, something else, which is that he came from an ordinary, humble background, and he had a habit, for example, of singing songs and telling stories and talking about his, ma his, his, his grandmother. Now, maybe from a distance, I wouldn't have believed it, but I've been there and I've seen it, and, I have, and his, his popularity and the credibility he had with people was absolutely incontestable. And the reason is because for 45 years, 
Venezuela had been run by a small, limited, self-perpetuating class of politicians in their own interests. And the, the section of the population that he came from had never had any involvement, any responsibility within the political system. It was run against them, not by them. Suddenly this man from a, whose background who's shone out of his face was in charge. The, the, you know, the, 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 the kind of bourgeois, the white bourgeois of Caracas were horrified. I mean, you know, I, I, I would meet people who'd start foaming at the mouth if you mentioned the word Chavez, you know. Um, we had, uh, my daughter came to visit me and we, we met with some friends of, of my partner. Um, uh, and in the course of the discussion, somebody talked about Chavez and the two of them, very nice people, nice bourgeois couple, good friends of the family, they suddenly turned into monsters. They started raging and ranting in a way that, you know, my daughter was going, what? That's what she said. What? What's going on? I said, well, they're raging and ranting about Chavez. Aha. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. the, the, the anger of the, of the, of the, of a, an opposite, of, of, a, of a bourgeois class which had enjoyed the fruits of power, the, the very profitable crumbs from the oil table. I mean, they got 1% of the profits from oil, but that was enough to keep a bourgeois lifestyle going for a minority. No problem with that anyway, so things changed. Then in April, they tried to overthrow him in a coup. Um, there was an Irish uh, film company, an Irish television film uh, company, making a documentary about Chavez at that moment and they were inside the palace when the coup took place. It's called The Revolution Will Be, will be Televised. It will not be televised. No, The Revolution Will Be Televised. Not be televised is, is, um, is, uh, is the song. Anyway, so they're, they're filming inside the palace, right? And they're filming the head of the business, uh, of the, of the business organization, the equivalent of the CBI, who arrives in this room surrounded by a couple of cardinals, um, uh, some lawyers, some politicians, and a few generals, who says, well, much against my, my will and my better judgment, I have been prevailed upon to take on the presidency of Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to have with, the, with me a presidential sash, which he pulled out of his pocket. <laughs> so it was, you know, he had no idea this was happening, but he brought a presidential sash in case. <laughs> and he put it on, and, and everybody toasted everybody else in champagne, um, you know, we have finally got rid of this populist government with its promises to redistribute oil wealth. And then the camera swings around and looks through the windows of the palace. And out in the street, tens of thousands of people are gathering. And by their dress and by their appearance, you know that these are the people from the poor barrios around Caracas who have come down to the, presidents, the presidential palace, surrounded it, and simply begin to chant, we want Chavez back, we want Chavez back, we want Chavez back. And they became hundreds of thousands, at which point uh, the, the presidential sash was put back, and he went to, he, I think he went to, to became a, a political exile, to sort of asylum in Panama, where presumably he had business interests, and, um, and Chavez had won. Now, at that point, the revolution in Venezuela took a great step forward. And in, the subsequent, in subsequent years, lots of events, but without going into too much detail, um, after it, the, the coup failed, Chavez, what was created in Venezuela were a series of organizations called the Missions. And the Missions were essentially programs for uh, welfare and public services. But the key thing was that they would be run by local communities themselves. So you had a state, an old state, a corrupt state, which had been run like all oil oil uh, economies, a corrupt state um, run by a few people, uh, uh, on the one hand the state and on the other hand this new uh, set of institutions which could be the embryo of a new and different and genuinely democratic state. So if you looked at Latin America at that point there is the embryo of a new kind of state being formed in Venezuela. There are the rising of the open town councils in, in, in Bolivia, which are drawing in tens of thousands of people, indigenous people, local workers, peasants, um, into, into increasingly acting to reverse you know, the, the tide of, no, uh, of uh, neoliberalism. Because uh, as soon as the water was, was won back in Cochabamba, then in the town of, uh, of the city of Los Altos, which is kind of above La Paz, there was a gas war 
and the water war in which one, they too you know, <coughs> won back the right to, co to, to collective control, communal control of water, and uh, to, to, really? Blimey. Uh, okay. Anyhow, um, I, I just had this signal which either means it's five o'clock or it means I've got five minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I might can I take a couple more minutes? Anyway, so this was the pink tie, and this was the, inspir the inspiring and positive example of a democratic process in action in which people were finally rising up against neo neoliberal capitalism and beginning to, if you like, push back, retrieve the losses they had made and begin to take control of the resources of their countries to be used for purposes in the interest of the majority. That was the pink tide. Um, if we look now, and I, I'm going to have to make this leap, because uh, Chavez was re-elected in 2006. In 2006, Evo Morales, was erect, uh, an indigenous president for the first time ever, was elected to the presidency of Bolivia. And a year later, a man called Rafael Correa, who was actually a Harvard economist, uh, was, elected with this, uh, was elected to the presidency of, of Ecuador. In each case, they came to power, they took control of the state because they were carried there by the movement from below. That's the pink tide, and that's, you know, in a sense, what is, what is most important about it. Uh, the legacy it leaves us, that these processes can occur. What then happens, however, <laughs> And it happened also in Brazil with Lula, is that, in a sense, two logics appear, really, at that moment. One logic is that power should return to the state, which should then administer the, the economy, uh, perhaps in slightly different ways, but that power should return to the machinery of the state. The other logic, the logic which was embedded in these movements I've been describing, was that there should be a new kind of power a new kind of power in society in which decision, the right of decision, the power to make decision, the establishment of priorities should be determined democratically by the mass movements of the base. And that became, it was a moment of tension between these two possibilities. Those who were carried to power took over the state, but instead, in, in a sense, of carrying forward the project for popular democracy, they became instead a new group of governors of the state. Yes, they made advances. Yes, they nationalized oil up to a point. Yes, they, they diverted some of the profits from oil and gas towards social programs to benefit the majority of the population. But the fundamental issue was not you know, more money for, for welfare programs. The fundamental issue was that societies, these societies should have new priorities determined democratically from below which would reshape these economies completely and which would break, finally, that characteristic of all the Latin American economies, which was their dependence on, the, on, on a world market and their control by that world market. There's a glorious book uh, by Eduardo Galeano called The Open Veins of Latin America, which describes Latin American history in those terms, how Latin America has been the, the prisoner of its resources, of its minerals, of its tin, of its gold, of its oil, of its gas, you know, of its copper. Because, you know, those, are, those, are, those products, those resources were not used by or, or used by the local populations, but taken out, extracted from the mountains, extracted from the, from the jungle, extracted from the sea, extracted from the soil, and taken away accumulated the wealth that they produced, accumulated in London, New York, Paris, and so on. That was the reality. And for the pink tide to begin to achieve its objectives, that had to change. And that was the question then. That was the, the issue posed by the end of that first decade of the, of, of the socialism of the 21st century. It was declared by, by, uh, by Chavez in 2005 at the World Social Forum. In, uh, in Porto Alegre. Um, but what was it? Was it participatory democracy as, as the, the, the movements had sought, or was it something else? Was it simply, you know, the old state with a different language, with a slightly more democratic relationship? Was it about open elections? I think it was clear that the logic of the movement from below was a new kind of world 
where social justice prevailed, where, where democratic objectives and the purpose of the majority would prevail and society would be organized around them. Instead, the process took a different direction. Uh, we can talk you know, about the detail of it, but the reality is that Hugo Chavez died mysteriously in circumstances which have never been explained, and I personally have never, I was never convinced. You know, something happened anyway. He was as healthy as hell. You know, he had the energy of three people, uh, but he died. He died in in, in uh, February of, 19, of, of 2013 and was succeeded by his foreign minister Nicolas Maduro, who claimed that Chavez. At one point, he claimed that Chavez had become a bird that was sitting on his shoulder. But actually, that story aside, he got to the presidency because he claimed to be the direct successor, the nominated successor, and the continuer of the policies of Hugo Chavez. In other words, he tried to mobilize his enormous popularity to get himself into the presidency. In fact, he got in by less than 1% of a majority, but he got in. What then began to happen was something very different, and how different, I can illustrate by one decision, one announcement that he made two years later in 2015. He announced that an area called the Arco Minero, which is the Orinoco Basin, um, which is 12% of the national territory, it's the size of Cuba. Uh, it's a region which is just, you know, packed with gold, minerals, copper, diamonds, oil, gas. It's an, um, um, an area of enormous wealth, but it's also in the Amazon Basin. And because it's in the Amazon Basin, it's also the source of Venezuela's, most of Venezuela's fresh water. But you can imagine, the multinational corporations were, were slavering at the very thought they might get in to uh, the Arco Minero. And Nicolás Maduro, the inheritor of the Bolivarian Revolution, announced in 2015 that, it, that 150 multinational companies had been given concessions to the Orinoco Basin and they would be allowed to exploit it for no payment at all for 10 years. What had happened? Then Rafael Correa, the president of Ecuador who had been carried there by the indigenous movement, turned against the indigenous movement, jailed its leaders, and announced that they were uh, infantile indigenous, infantile environmentalists. Of course they were, because all they wanted to do was save their territories from being, from being ravaged by the, by the mineral companies, most of them actually in the case of, of, um, of Ecuador, Chinese and Canadian, who wanted to get at Ecuador's enormous resources of copper, among other things, and oil. In Bolivia, the same thing was happening because um, uh, in, uh, in 2016, no, late 2015, the same thing was happening. It's a national park called Tipnis, uh, which is uh, an area occupied by a number of indigenous communities, small farmers and so on, who had been given the same guarantees as everybody else had in the Ecuadorian constitution and the, and the Venezuelan constitution, that the interests and rights of indigenous communities would be a priority, uh, a priority uh, right protected by the constitution. That was one of the fundamental changes that brought about the support for these new governments. Instead, Rafael Correa had begun to attack them. And in the Tipnis National Park, where the communities of farmers were protected by the new constitution, the government suddenly announced that they were opening a a major highway through the park in order to facilitate um, the, ex the, the export of resources from Bolivia to Brazil and Argentina, run by multinational companies based in Brazil. The people of the area protested and marched towards La Paz and they were met by the police and repressed. Um, the, the project was stopped, but two years later it's back. Meanwhile, in, in, uh, in an area of Ecuador called Yasuni, which had been used by, uh, 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 by Chevron to produce oil, and which had been left, I saw it, it had been left in a kind of polluted morass. The whole area polluted, like most of the Amazon, and under Bolsonaro, the rest of the Amazon will be polluted too, because mining of gold, the way it's practiced, uses mercury, poisons the rivers, right? That's the way they extract gold. I mean, the, the devastation is there to be seen. And yet, 
these governments which have been elected to change the way things were done, to halt the, the, you know, the, the exploitation and abuse of, of, of resources by the multinational capital, had now returned to renegotiate with multinational capital and, in a sense, to open the veins of their mountains and of their rivers again to an exploitative, uh, extractive industry from abroad whose interests were solely in extracting the minerals and who had no kind of social responsibility at all. It seemed the tide had turned completely. It certainly seemed that way. There's one example, I, I, two or three minutes, okay. Mm -hmm. There's one example which particularly uh, touched me. Uh, I had been in, in northern Chile and I took the train over the Bolivian Altiplano, which if any of you know it, is just extravagantly beautiful. And in the center of it is a salt lake, a salt pan, where the waves are frozen in salt. It's just incredibly beautiful. So you'll imagine my, my, the, the, my distress when I, when I heard that they had discovered under the salt pan huge uh, resources of coltan, which is used by uh, mobile phone companies. I don't even know what it is or what it's for, but it's there and they use it. And uh, new contracts have been signed with the Japanese and the Chinese company to exploit it. I will never see that salt pan again because it will be destroyed as that whole area always has been destroyed by the exploitation of the minerals from below. There is no responsibility. So what do we have? We have, in a sense, a, the hope and inspiration of a pink tide betrayed by those who came to power specifically and explicitly to speak for them. Why? I'm afraid the answer is so obvious I'm almost embarrassed to say it, and that is they were bought. Corruption. Corruption, I mean, it's kind of encapsulated by one company called Odebrecht. I don't know if you've come across them. Odebrecht is a Brazilian multinational, very powerful multinational company, um, whose director is now in jail, one among many, but at least he's in jail. Um, but Odebrecht had a special department exclusively created to bribe public officials with a budget of $1.3 billion. Now, you know, I think, I think there are two things here to be said, and it's what I try to say, I hope, a little more elaborately in the conclusion to the book. And that's number one, people were corrupted by the promise of enormous wealth. The corruption was profound. But the corruption is only half an explanation. The other half of the explanation is, why was that corruption possible? And the answer to that, I think, is the other half of the equation. When, when states, politicians, and leaders sever the connect, you know, if you like, the relationship of accountability, no longer have to account for their actions to democratic organizations, no longer have an active, mobilized population overseeing what they do, criticizing what they do, judging what they do, when that connection is broken, then the field is open for politicians to, 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 to become corrupt and to steal and to pursue whatever, they, whatever ends they want, to, they, want to, um, they want to pursue. So what I'm saying really in my conclusion is that to understand corruption, human frailty, human weakness is not an explanation. What is an explanation is that when, when power is, is assumed and when the, when the oversight of democratic organizations over the way society makes its decisions, is broken, then the situation is ideal. The situation is created in which corruption will grow up. Of course these individuals are greedy. Of course they were tempted by the millions and millions, I mean really millions and millions and millions that they have taken out of the state coffers and embedded them, for example, in the Bank of Andorra. Next time you see the Bank of Andorra, a little bank, don't be convinced by what it looks like. It's full of money. In the, in the Bank of Andorra's case, Venezuelan money. But in a sense, it's, it's, it's the, the political system that has allowed that to happen. So my conclusion is, in one sense, uh, disappointing, which is that the process has been corrupted, undermined, and the, the, and the power won by the people was taken back from them. And they have been left demoralized, disorganized, disarmed, with no control over the governments they carried to power in order to control them from below. That's one thing. 
But the other conclusion, which I hope is a little more positive, is that we have a legacy from those movements. The demonstrable reality that such movements, that, that resistance can grow up, that it can be organized from below, and that participatory democracy is a meaningful alternative, and that it can be created. Only next time around, it has to be defended at all costs.